of our military service and the cross to the pulpit today. And I am thankful for his friendship. Uh, got to meet him several years ago serving on the Texas District Youth Committee. And uh, my first impression of him uh, was at a, a, a meeting, a youth meeting. And uh, he had to take care of some church business where he was uh, associate pastor, working as pastor, assistant pastor. And, uh, but I'll never forget, he just comes in and he hangs his head and he lets us know the battles he's been fighting. And I thought, that's my first impression of Charles John. But over the years, amen, uh, he's encouraged me and, and uh, we've just had a great time together. Some of you may remember him. I, I know Brother Staines remembers him. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, um, wherever he flew off to. But uh, uh, for many years, he worked our camps. And, but you know what? I believe he's got a word from the Lord for us today. And I want him to bring the word of the Lord to Peace Tabernacle. And whatever God lays on his heart, I want him to preach the word. Amen? Everybody say, God bless you, Brother Johnson. Thank you for coming, sir. Good morning, and thank you for the privileged pastor, Sister Bumgarner, this wonderful church family, to our elders and leaders, and to all of the members, to our friends and guests today, and especially our veterans, those that are here in service, but those that have served and have gone on to meet the Lord, those that have paid the price for our country, but those that have also paid the price to bring us where we are today. We salute you. We honor you. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. I am, like Pastor said a moment ago, I'm, I'm, I am a very proud Air Force veteran. I was born on an Air Force base. I was raised by an Air Force sergeant. Uh, I was a benefactor of the, the goodness of uh, my dad and the pension that the Air Force gave to him every month. And then I loved it so much, I said, you know, when I turned 18, I said, I think I'll go try it. And uh, to this day, I'm humbled every time that I go uh, to the doctor. Uh, I do have my own private health care, but I also use the Veterans Hospital there in Houston for routine checkups. It, it makes me appreciate my service, but especially those men and women that have served. But today our service is Memorial Day weekend, and I, I thought it was so appropriate that we would remember the men and women that have served our country, but also the men and women that have served the church of the living God. And so, again, what a privilege, what an honor it is to be a part of this service and to remember them in such a special way. So we, again, salute you. Uh, it's a privilege this morning to have my wife and daughter with me. Very rarely are they able to travel with me. My wife's a school teacher. My daughter just finished nursing school downtown Houston and uh, is fixing to start her job. And um, so our traveling days, uh, many, I, I, I'm not saying are over. They're just limited to a degree, but I'm very proud of her, and I'm so thankful they could be with me this morning. And again, Pastor, thank you. Why don't we give Pastor and Sister Bumgarner a great big hand. We appreciate their vision, their love, their service to this church, to this community, to this family of God. Amen. I'd like for you to remain standing. I want to I wanna preach this morning. I, I want to really tie into the theme here today. Uh, I'm going to try my very best. Um, and I'll, I'll just say my objective from the, from the front or the start of the message today is the older I get, the more I realize it's not hard to get into the church of the living God. Amen. To repent and to be baptized in the name of Jesus, filled with his Holy Spirit. Um, it, it's a free gift that God has extended to us. But the longer I live, uh, and the more I try to emulate him in my spirit and in my speech, I'm learning that it's really, really important to finish strong. And if you know of someone who's gone on to be with the Lord, I thought of Brother N.A. Urshan this morning and Brother E.L. Holly. I thought of Sister Holly. I was preaching a revival in Lufkin, Pastor. And in her waning days, she was taking chemotherapy. I was preaching for Leon Wallace there in Lufkin. 
And uh, Sister Holly, with the sentence of death on her life, was in the altar praying for young people. I've never forgotten that. She looked at me one night, and I mean, I had preached the best that my little old self could preach, and she bragged on me, made me feel like I was, you know, like Anthony Mangan or something. And uh, she made me feel good about myself. And I thought about, you know, Sister Kilgore. I thought about the Elder Kilgore. And, and, and men of God and women of God that have spoken. You know, I thought of Brother Mangan, G.A. Mangan, and his vision for missions. And um, an old evangelist this morning that I, I thought of that Melody and I, when we were just kids and dating. And old Brother Givens, E.R. Givens, a prophet of God. He didn't get to face on a, on a Pentecostal herald, wasn't in the Texas Sentinel magazine, but his name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life. He was a prophet of God. And uh, I just thought of the many times we were in service and he would pray and he would preach the word of God. And, and I'll be honest with you folks, I'm a first generation Pentecostal. I'm born in the fire and I love every bit of it. Hallelujah. And... Um, I'm trying my very best to, to walk with God, and I want to, if anything today, I want to be the kind of saint of God, the kind of man of God that I could tell my daughter, and then hopefully if the Lord tarries my grandchildren someday, of the way of walking with God and serving God and being faithful. So today, my message is basically going to be not to memorialize those that have gone. Yes, we honor them. But today I want to challenge you, the living, that you would attain to such a report of faith as those that have gone on before us. Those that have obtained and have walked and are worthy, amen, of remembrance today that impacted our lives. If God tarries, may our lives be that kind of memorial so that our children, our grandchildren, church members, friends, neighbors could look back and say, you know what? That was a genuine Christian. They were real, and they walked with God, and they had influence in my life. So today, I want to preach to you on the subject of vessels of honor. I want to challenge you to be a vessel of honor for the kingdom of God in this day in which we live. Father, thank you for the people of God. Thank you for the man of God and his family, Lord, that served this church and this community, the leaders and the people of God that make up this congregation, for our friends and our guests that are here today. Let them feel the drawing of the Holy Spirit, the love of God, and may we hear from the word and may it impact our life. In Jesus' name, let every believer say amen. Now, before you get seated, get comfortable, I need you to turn around and greet somebody and wish them a happy Memorial Day weekend. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. We're looking forward to the fellowship after church today and hope to get to meet some of you and hear your testimony. Um, there was a young woman one time going through a very s severe time of testing in her life. And she talked to her mother and she said, Mom, I really don't know what I'm going to do. And uh, she began to cry and began to have a very heart-to-heart -heart moment. And that mother said, hey, baby, let's go into the kitchen. And they got out three pots, and they filled them with water. And she looked at her daughter. She said, I'm going to teach you something about life. So they began to boil the water, and soon enough, Mom got out three ingredients. She got out some carrots, and she got out some eggs, and she got out some coffee beans. And the water came to a boil, and Mom dropped the carrots in there, the egg in one, and then the coffee bean in another. And as time would pass, in just a few moments, uh, the process uh, of the heat uh, took its toll. And Mom poured the water out, strained it, and uh, put the carrots in a bowl, carefully dipped the egg out, and uh, placed it in a bowl and took the coffee and poured it in a cup. And the daughter just sitting there just wide-eyed like, what in the world, Mom, you have flipped your lid. <laughs> What's going on here? And Mom looked at her and said, Honey, you know, the pressures of life and, and, and trials and things that people go through, it changes them. 
And if you want to be, you could be like the carrot. You could be cold and unrelenting and stiff. But when you go through the fire, it can bring you out so soft and moldable and pliable. And it can also make you so soft it'll make you weak. Well, take the egg, for example. That egg, though it seemed like its thin outer shell had protected it, the real work was on the inside because while it was sitting in the fire, it indeed became hardened. And I've seen some people, unfortunately, that when they've gone through situations, difficult times and trials, they've become hardened in their spirit toward God, toward people, toward their family and friends, and seemingly or, or you can't touch them. You can't get close to them. But then I've seen people that are like that coffee bean. The coffee bean, when the water, when it was placed in the water, that coffee bean changed its environment. It caused a fragrance and an aroma to fill the house that neither the carrot nor the egg was able to do. That coffee bean actually changed the water. The very circumstance that was supposed to bring pain. When the water got hot, the bean released its fragrance and flavor. And so today I ask you the question, if you're like the coffee bean, when things get bad, you get better. When things get hot and the situation around you begins to change and the hour is dark and the, and, and the trail and the, and the hounds of hell are knocking on your door, adversity is facing you and you don't know what to do, I ask you the question today, are you willing to elevate yourself to the next level? Are you willing to become happy and are you willing to, be, to become dependent and are you willing to say, God, not my will, but thy will help me pass this time? test because you see people that live for God 20 and 30 and 40 and 50 years and that they have the victory right. then there's some people that go to the church for 20 and 30 and 40 years but they don't have the victory right. on, I'm talking about people that walk with God they've learned how to stand and go through the situations in life and they've learned how to yield their spirit and say God whatever I'm going through let it bring out the best in me those are the kind of people that are worth honoring those are the kind of people that are worth uh, following in their footsteps those are the kind of people that can be a hero and a tangible amen witness of the spirit amen so that we can follow them amen all the way to our heavenly home it's not how you start it really is how you finish. And I just feel like there's a challenge in the Holy Ghost today. I'm challenging you, Peace Tabernacle. I'm challenging you to run your race with grace and dignity and honor and serve God faithfully and finish strong. When I was in the military, one of the last official acts I had I was an honor graduate from basic training. I went below the zone. I was promoted early, and I appreciated the benefit of it. I was a red rope in tech school, et cetera, et cetera, and that means nothing. Marksman with an M16, I can hit it. I was one time going hunting, and my little wife, bless her heart, she said, now, baby, do you know what? And I looked at her, I said, Melody, I'm a marksman in the military. She said, oh, I forgot. She was afraid. She didn't want me to get hurt out there at a deer stand. Bless her heart. But one of the last things that I did, official act, Pastor, is my uh, NCO, non-commissioned officer in charge, and my officer OIC was in charge of us. They presented me with my good conduct medal. And I remember when Victoria was just a small girl, she was digging up in my dresser drawer one day for some reason I don't know, and she found it, and she said, Dad, what's this? And I said, that's my good conduct medal. I wish I'd have brought it today. I thought about it too late. I apologize. But on my DD Form 214, if you were in the military, you know what that is. That's like your, your marriage and death certificate at the same time, okay? And it's got it on there, Air Force 
conduct, good conduct medal. And I looked at that. And um, I never took it for granted because what that meant was is I was a good soldier. And that I, I raised my right hand there in Richmond, Virginia, never forget it. 18-year-old kid scared to death. How in the world am I going to do this? But you know what? I did it and walked with God and served God faithfully and came out and, and was blessed because of it. And it gave me confidence to become the man that I am today. And the point is, is I was able to stick with a commitment, see it all the way through and finish strong and do it right. And today we have a generation of young people and young couples that know how to get something started, but they don't know how to stick with it. They want to get on a job and quit it. They want to start this and quit that. They want to buy a home and next week they want to move. I'm telling you, I've had the same bank account for 23 years. I'm talking about we need a generation of young people and young adults that know how to get a commitment to God, to themselves, to one another. I was nearly offended at Walmart here about two years ago. I'm standing there trying to use my Discover card, and, 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 and they called me while I'm standing there in line, and they said, someone's trying to steal your identity. We're going to cancel your car. And I said, you can't. They said, why? I said, I'm fixing to use it. They said, sir, that card's dead. And I said, well, can I get my new one? They said, yeah, we'll have it there tomorrow. The only problem was is I had that number memorized. I could travel anywhere. I knew my discovery. I don't know the new one. I, I, I don't even want to learn it. What are you saying? I'm talking about finishing strong. And that's what people that do that become vessels of honor. They know how to serve God in the good times. And they know how to serve God in the bad times. They know how to serve God when they got a pocket full of money and they know how to serve God when they're broke. They know how to serve God when the church is on fire and they know how to serve God when every demon in hell has come against them. I'm talking about vessels that know how to serve God. So if you're struggling today in your walk with God, if you're struggling in your faithfulness, if you're struggling in your commitment, welcome to the game of life. You were born out of your mother's womb struggling. You struggled to learn how to walk. You struggled to learn how to do cursive. I remember in grade school they had those green charts up there and they tried to show you how to make letters. I still can't do it. I looked at my handwriting recently and I said, my God, you need to do better than that. But I tell you what, I can still sign a check and they ain't asking me if I got my J right. Hallelujah. <laughs> you struggle, amen, when you're a teenager with your first girlfriend or boyfriend or your acne or you're trying to grow up and being an adult. You struggle with algebra. You go to college and you struggle with responsibility. You get married and you struggle with relationships. You have children and you struggle with having children. Then you get middle age and you struggle with the woulda, coulda, shoulda. And then you get to struggling that I don't know what God's going to do with me. And then you get old and you, and you struggle to make it on your social security check. And I've stood in hospital rooms and bedsides with saints of God, pastor, that were struggling to take their last breath. They were struggling with what they were going to do and take care of their family. Got a phone call this week, a dear friend of mine, a pastor that I love and served under, struggling in the latter years and, and days and months of his life. Struggling. Well, Brother Johnson, you don't understand. Oh, really, honey, you don't understand. Struggle is a part of the game. But the difference between a vessel of honor and a vessel of dishonor, those that are worth remembering and those that are a dime a dozen that you can buy at, the, at, at Walmart or down here at the flea market, is that vessel of honor says, this test is not going to beat me. I am going to win. I'm going to overcome. I'm going to be faithful to God and God's going to see me through. There was a little child one time visiting their grandmother. Grandmother was in the kitchen. Baby was in there in the family room. Now we call them, I guess, dens or, you know, man caves or, you know, we called them family rooms when we were kids. I think we need to get more family rooms in the house and get rid of the man caves. 
Anyway, that, that went over like a, a pork sandwich at a bar mitzvah, but that's okay. That baby's in there digging in, found, found Grandma's Bible and, and got to flipping through it and noticed, man, there was t t pages that were torn and, and, and there were scriptures that were highlighted and, and there were stains on it. And, 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 and she, it, the child was just fascinated and Grandma came back in there and she said, Grandma, what, what, what is this? And, and Grandma sat down and it was like a, a, a fresh brand new light came to her eyes and her spirit. She felt invigorated and she sat down and she said, well, baby... This is my Bible. And, and the child was just totally enamored. It was just, well, well, Grandma, what's this in the margin here? This T slash P. Now, folks, I got tickled this morning coming down the highway when I saw the TP Motel. I mean, if you own it, I'm not throwing rocks at you. I think it's great. I've just never seen anything like that. I've traveled all over the United States, and I'm like, my God, right here in my backyard, I'm making reservations. My wife wants to go there on vacation. I'm telling you, we ought to just do it. We'll come stand here and stay for a week or hallelujah. Then she got out of the car and said, my God, it's humid here. I said, well, honey, you're close to the coast, you know. But anyway, notice that TP and said, Grandma, what does that mean? She said, baby, that means that scripture there is tried and proven. I think I'm looking at some saints at Pete's Tabernacle on this Sunday morning. You're well on your way to being a vessel of honor. Because I think inside of your Bible, you might not have wrote it down, but inside of your heart, maybe the Holy Spirit wrote it down and put a big T by there and a big P. I've been tried and I've been proven. It's one thing to be tried. It's another thing to stand the test. Daniel thrown innocently into a, lion, a den of lions. Joseph falsely accused. Numerous others, as Pastor mentioned moments ago, the, the hero and the father of our faith, the Lord Jesus Christ, innocently charged, falsely accused, but still tried and proven. What an object lesson today. I'd like to mention to you for a few moments, I wanted to mention the life of Abraham, how the Bible says that he was called of God to offer Isaac there on Mount Moriah. I've stood on that mount. Uh, it's there on that mount that they believe Solomon built the temple. It's there on that mount that David offered the sacrifice when the death angel stood with its sword drawn over Jerusalem. I've stood there and I've looked at it. Really, to be honest with you, it's really not that impressive. I was looking for this Jerusalem, the city of God. It's about 15 acres on the top of a mountain that Solomon leveled off, and it's as flat as a wagon up there. It's just, but you know, I'm looking for this great, you know, these great rivers and all of this, and some of the creeks we have in Texas are bigger than that. And so the geographical understanding is what blew me away. But the point of it is, is this was a place, a sacred place, where God called him to sacrifice. And here's what vessels of honor do when God calls them to sacrifice. They yield to the will of the master. They might not understand it, but they know that God knows what he's doing. So Abraham gathers everything together, gets his boy together. They go forth, and, and if you don't know the Bible story, be glad to teach it to you at, some, at the right time. But the, the point of it is, is this. Abraham did everything that he knew to do, and he stretched forth his hand and lifted his knife, and God said, I can trust this man. I can trust this man. He is a kind of man that I can elevate and promote. And in James, we see the scripture in James chapter 1. The Bible says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life. You see, most people fail when they go through circumstances and situations because they don't realize that at the end of it, God has a crown and a promotion for them in this life and in the world to come. I want to preach a full gospel today 
that if God ever tries you in this life, God will promote you in this life. If God tries you in this life, he's going to elevate you and everybody around you is going to see it because you've been faithful to God. But in those trials, I have seen people with four types of faith is what the Bible says. Romans 12 and 3 mentions a measure of faith. Mark 4 and 4 talks about no faith. Matthew 16 and 8, little faith. But Matthew 8 and 10 says great faith. There's four kinds of faith. And I'm wondering who I'm preaching to today. I want to be that fourth kind. A man that has great faith in God. You see, these levels are graduate levels in the economy of God. And in the scripture setting, Abraham had lived for God 58 years by the time God God called him to this Mount Moriah experience. So I have found something with God. The older you get, the more experience you have with God, the greater the sacrifice the greater the call because God desires greatness in you and it's going to come with a price, a teachable, humble, and obedient spirit. Oh, you might have had it as a new convert, but do you still have it now? I might have been a prayer warrior when I had the Holy Ghost for three months, but am I still a prayer warrior now? I might have loved the Word of God when I just got into church, but do I still love the Word of God now? You see, great nations consist of great people. And great churches consist of great people with great faith. We need great people at Peace Tabernacle. I don't care how much education you have. I don't care what your family business is. I want to know if you have great faith. I don't care what your resume is and and how long you've done this. I just want to know, am I preaching to a group of people today that say, Brother Johnson, I'd like to be a person with great faith. I'd like to be the kind of vessel that God can test and God can prove. I'll never forget I was 29 years old. 29, just a kid. I used to think 29, you were a man. 29 now, to me, you're a kid. I saw someone the other day, she's about 12 years old, and I said, look at that baby. My daughter said, Dad, that's not a baby, that's a child. I said, honey, when you're 47, that's a baby. Hallelujah. (laughs) 30, okay, you're getting there. Hallelujah. But I was 29 years old, just a kid. Kid preacher trying to do the work of God. Melody and I... Our anniversary came around every year. Isn't that amazing? (laughs) And on, we uh, our anniversaries, man. We had some horrendous luck, man. It was terrible. Car broke down one time. Our third anniversary, we're eating a a number one combo at Whataburger. We had to cut it in half. (laughs) Both cars in the shop didn't have enough money to get them out. Twenty-three years old. Then my my daddy got sick and died on the day of our anniversary. And here I am now on our our ninth anniversary, and I'm sitting in the doctor's office in Galveston, and the doctor looks at me and says, Son, you have the worst case of lymphoma cancer I've ever seen in my life. And I looked at him, and I said, Pardon me? I said, Man, I thought I was on the, uh, uh, the dialysis ward. I wondered what those people were doing over in those chairs over there, wrapped up in blankets and had hats on. I thought, I said, man, they've made a mistake. They got me in the wrong place. And he said, no, we hadn't made a mistake. I knew I was in trouble, Pastor, when I was in the, I was in the, uh, the waiting area. And I know why they call it waiting area. Bless God. They ought to call it, I don't know what, the, maybe family room. I mean, because it ain't no waiting area. It's, you know, it's not 20 minutes. It's like 15 hours. But anyway, I... I read everything, and I'm going through the book, and, and every symptom that was in that particular disease, I said, well, I got that, I got that, I got that. I mean, I got to going down. <laughs> I mean, I was like nose diving going down, 29 years old. And he looked at me and said, you have lymphoma cancer. And, and my mind checked out. And I could see his mouth moving like this. You, 
I, 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 was in, I was in a daze. My ears were ringing, and his mouth was moving. And, and, I, and I came to when Melody squeezed my hand. I don't know what made her do it. But when she squeezed my hand, I felt strength go through my body. And uh, I looked at him and I said, Doctor, I said, um, I'm going home. He said, Son, you don't realize how sick you are. I said, Sir, you don't know how realize how serious I am. I said, You've scared me to death. <laughs> See, I'd already been to the one doctor, and they diagnosed me with all this stuff. And I thought I was here, you know, for, you know, a second opinion. You know, the one that says, no, they got it wrong. <laughs> you know, like, no, everything's fine. Go home. But the first doctor scared me. Now the second doctor scared me. And I'm just sitting there. And, and I remember driving. And we got on that little ferry to go back to Beaumont. And I looked over at Melody. And I said, Melody, I wish it was our third anniversary again. Because two cars in the shop, no money, is a whole lot easier than lymphoma, death sentence, cancer. Amen. You know, I'll trade. Anyway, long story short, we went to God in prayer, people of God praying. I won't tell you all the details, but God miraculously healed my body. I looked at the doctor. I said, I'm going home. i got to preach a revival this weekend. He said, I wouldn't do that. I said, I tell you what, I'll die in the pulpit. Now, you can call that ignorant or call it what you want to. I call it determination. I went to that pulpit that Friday night. I grabbed that microphone just like I did this morning. And somewhere in that preaching, God healed my body. I felt it. And everybody that's had cancer since then that I've laid my hands on, God has healed them. I, that didn't go over too good. I'm going to say it again. God gave me dominion over it so that when I lay my hands on it, God uses me to help heal people. And the reason I'm preaching like that this morning is it was tough to hear that death sentence. It was tough with all the symptoms and the pain and the problem and the worry. But now I get to receive the glory and the honor and the benefit of having stood the test that God allowed to come to my life. The devil did not put that cancer on me. God allowed it to come on me. You may be seated. But I remember one night, Pastor Bumgarner, I mean, boy, this was the night that I was shaking in my shoes. And I won't describe all the symptoms. They're too inappropriate. But I couldn't sleep. I was tossing and turning, tossing to and fro. And I got up and I went and laid in the little room there that was a little guest room. And I laid down in that bed. And I looked up toward heaven. And I said, I said, Father, I'm scared. Not many things scare me, but that scared me. In a few minutes, I heard those little feet hit the ground. We only had one child. God forgive me, I should have had 20. I'd have probably had to have three wives and ten concubines. Hallelujah. But we had one. Yes, help me, Jesus. God help me. Hallelujah. I'm joking for those of you that are our guests today. Her little feet hit the floor. She slept right in between mom and dad. She was just a baby. And she felt her way through that dark, and I can still feel it, Pastor Bumgarner. She walked into that room, and she looked at me, and she said, Dad, what are you doing in here? I said, Baby, I couldn't sleep. I pulled her up in the bed there beside me. Her little eyes were looking around that room. She wasn't, wasn't very familiar with that room. She didn't play in there, didn't go in there. It wasn't off limits, just unfamiliar. And... uh she looked around, and you could tell she was a little disoriented. She said, Daddy, I'm scared. I said, why are you scared when you're in my arms? I mean, I rolled over and held her, pulled her up close to me. I mean, in just a minute, that kid was out. Out. I'm talking gone, out. I'm loving on her little cheek, give her a little smooch. And 
she's all, everything's cool. And I turn over on my left side and the Holy Ghost spoke to me and said, why are you scared when you're in my arms? I said, whoa. Whoa. So the point I'm trying to say today is this. If you want great faith, you got to go through great testing in order to get it. If you want to be a vessel of honor, you got to go through the trials of faith and the trials of, of testing so that you can be that kind of vessel. I've been privileged in my life to visit Biltmore Manage Mansion in, in Asheville, North Carolina. The Paps Mansion in Milwaukee. The Bishop's Palace right here what they call the Biltmore of the West, west of the Mississippi. I've driven by the White House many times. As a child, played in the Capitol and, and all of the monuments. My dad was a police officer there. The, the, you know, the Palace of Versailles in France. And you can go through the great houses in, in, around the world. But I promise you, if you ever look at a book of architecture or, or you ever study those particular venues, you do not walk up to those. I've been to, to, to Monticello, Mount Rush, I mean, uh, Mount, Mount, Mount Vernon there, uh, our early American fathers, and many more other great places, and I'm sure you have as well. But you don't walk up to the outside of those houses and say, wow, what stucco. Isn't that beautiful? Check out those shingles. I mean, we're not enamored with shingles. We will look at the color and we will notice the landscape. But I'll tell you what defines a great house. Is the amenities that are on the inside of it. I don't pull up to a house and say, check out that slab. Isn't that a great slab? Isn't that sheetrock? Boy, it's just straight. No, you don't do that. It's the, t it's the pieces of furniture that are in the house. It's the decoration, the decor, the amenities. Matter of fact, an empty house really has no glory. Real estate agents will tell you that empty houses are harder to sell than houses that are full. The emphasis then is on the furnishings. What makes the house beautiful? Maybe the missus, the, the mom, the mother, the wife of the house, and, and, and some of her arts and crafts. Maybe the kitchen. Maybe the different types of, of studies and etc. The types of paneling and the doors and the gems that are in the woodwork and the fireplaces. That's what they talk about on the tours. They don't look at you and say, you know, that pine there behind the wall that you can't see. They don't talk about that. It's the stuff that really doesn't matter. So I have a scripture today, Peace Tabernacle, and the Bible says this. The foundation of God stands sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but of also of wood and earth, some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel of honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use and prepared for every good work. So today I'm preaching to you. What kind of vessel do you want to be? When I walked in here today and I felt the move of the Holy Ghost doing worship, I knew where that came from. Those are vessels of honor. And the worship that went up in this house. And the fragrance and the anointing and the aroma of the Holy Ghost. Hey, I've never been here before. But I'm like, whoa, I feel like I'm at home. Hallelujah. Because that doesn't just happen. Amen. That's because there's people that love God and have given themselves to God. And the worship that we had here, the prayer moments ago, and the giving, and, and what makes our children's ministry here, and the ladies, and the vacation Bible school. I nearly flipped out when you said that. I'm jealous because you have one and we don't. I mean that. I'm sincere. I'm like, wow, what a, what a treat. And I saw the children on a victory march today, and I said, thank God they're learning how to march in the house of God. We still believe in having the victory, amen, and living for God. Because we want to teach our children to be vessels of honor. And the way that happens is when we live and we go through the test. You know, God doesn't announce tests to us. He's the master of the pop quiz. I know about you, but I hated pop quizzes in school. I, I passed most of them, failed a few. But you know, God 
He didn't tell the rich young ruler that day what he really wanted. He said, son, I need you to go sell out everything you've got. Give it to the poor and follow me. And that kid couldn't get over it because his wealth and his position meant more to him than his relationship with God. And so Rebecca, when she was filling up the water troughs for those camels, God didn't tell her, hey, baby, you fill these camels up. You're going to get all the treasure. And so those 10 camels, after she finishes watering them, they estimate about 22 to 25 gallons per camel times 10, 250 gallons of water that she has to hand pull at that well and feeds it, takes her literally hours to do it. And she's sweating and she's profuse over there. Just and she's like, my God, I didn't know they had 10 camels. Anyway, when they get done, then the man looks at her and says, hey, take me to your father. Well, come to find out, the whole story unfolds. And what's so beautiful about it is the ten camels she watered, when she went home, all of the gold that was in there was hers. Joseph, what dreams he had, what, what promises from God. But it looked like the dreams became a nightmare for years until God proved him and God could promote him. I just got a feeling that God is trying to test some people here in this church. I just got a feeling that God's trying to prove some people in this church. And if you will stand and be faithful to God, God is going to promote you and honor you and produce great faith in your life. You see, it's the trick of the enemy when you face opposition for you to become full of despair, despondency, and full of depression. He tries to cause us to forget our purpose, to forget God's plan, and we can no longer taste the sweet victory that awaits us. But it becomes a bitter pill that we must endure. But I'm here to remind you today that God is faithful. And if you will be faithful to God, God will come through for you. In Psalm 23, and I don't have time to do all of it, but there are several scriptures, there's several parts of action verbs in that psalm. I'm going to leave it with you. The Bible says He's making us, He's leading us, He's restoring us, He's preparing us, He's anointing us so that our cup shall overflow. Most people get caught up with, well, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, He maketh. Well, what does He do? He makes me to lie down. He leads me. He restores me. Amen. The Bible said he prepares a table before me. Here's one trial. Let, let yourself go through a trial, and God will cause your enemies to stand and watch you be blessed. He will cause your enemies to have to stand back and watch you sit there and be blessed. As he prepares a table for me in the... Pre Watch this. He didn't say, I prepare a table in the presence of God. He said, I'll prepare a table in the presence of your enemy. So, saying of God, go with me down the end of that particular path. Look over your shoulder right now and see if mercy... Amen. And see if what the Bible says, goodness is following you. You might not see the shepherd that's ahead because of the fog of circumstance. But if you can't see the future, just look over and say, oh, there's goodness. Oh, there's mercy. God must be my shepherd. And he's leading me down the right path. Well, pastor, I can't see. Well, pastor, I don't know. Hey, baby, you don't have to see. You don't have to know. All you have to do is trust him. He knows the way that you take. He's going to direct your steps. Well, I need an, I need an analytical proof. And I, well, baby, you in the wrong book, honey. Well, we need to do a financial analysis and we need to do a probability study. Oh, okay. You treat God like that, he won't be around. 
I think the Bible says that we walk by faith and not by... Oh, isn't that amazing? It's not what I can see with these. It's what I can perceive with this. He knows the way that I take. He knows what's inside of me. David said, Lord, create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. Psalm 139, I read it yesterday. He said, search me, God. See if there's anything inside of me that's unclean and ungodly. God, search me. God, I want to be a vessel of honor. I want to be pure and righteous and holy. And God, if I will do my part, you'll do yours. You may be seated. In Genesis 12, Abraham, 75 years old, he builds an altar, calls on the name of the Lord, and backslides. He goes to Egypt. He goes back to the nightclub, goes back to the world, the father of the faith. In Genesis 13, he checks out of Egypt, goes back to his first altar, and has to encounter domestic problems with a troubled young man in his life, his nephew. Genesis 14, Abraham learns to pay tithes. He breaks his nephew out of jail. That goofball kid's driving him nuts. See, you didn't know that. You thought it was just you, but no, Abraham had to deal with the same thing. Genesis 15, his prayer becomes more personal and intense. God calls Abram for a sacrifice and gives him detailed promises. Genesis 16, he's 86 years old. Oops, woman trouble. At 86, yes. Je leave that alone. Genesis 17, 99 years old. 13 years after his oops. And God speaks to him and says, I want to give you covenant relationship." I'm going to remind you who you are. Abraham acts with immediate obedience. In just one more chapter, Genesis 18, he's now entertaining angels and intercedes for a lost nephew. That kid's still causing him problems. Genesis 19, he witnesses the tragedy of Sodom and Gomorrah. The wrath of God is poured out upon the disobedient, and Abraham learns to walk uprightly. Genesis 20, for some reason, he journeys south and gets a little cold again. Isn't that amazing? Genesis 21, 100 years old, God visits him. Isaac is born. Domestic problems come to a head 13 years later when Ishmael and his mother Hagar get into a fight and fuss with Sarah and Isaac. And then he's forced to pay child support and alimony. Well, baby, I really need you to leave. No, you got to leave. No, you're going to leave. Here's a bucket of water and some coins. And boots her. Yeah, the father of the faithful. Genesis 22. Some theologians believe Isaac is 17, some 33. Whatever the point. He's been living for God now for decades. And God says, Abraham, I'm going to try you. No. He said, Abraham, I want you to offer your sacrifice to me. Because see, your, your sacrifice is really God testing you. God's call for you to give and be obedient and love him is really God's test in your life to see if you will be faithful. So here's three lessons that Abram learned and his Abraham learned in the older years of his life. It's he was striving to be that vessel that God could use. Here's what you and I need to take from that story. That you cannot rest on your past experience of what God did 10, 20, 30, or 40 years ago. Number two, it seems the older you get, the greater the sacrifice and the test. Lastly, but if you pass the test... God will reveal himself to you in a greater dimension just like he did to Abraham when he said, I am Jehovah Jireh. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to multiply you. I'm going to give you victory over your enemies and make you an international witness of my glory. You see, revelation only comes when you pass the test of obedience. Revelation from God and deeper understanding comes when you pass the test 
But without the test, you can't be proven. And without the test, you can't become a vessel of honor. Because vessels that are treasured and they're put on display and for the guests to look at in ooh and ah over that define the house, they are the ones that have to stand the pressure and the test of time. They're valuable. They're precious. And so today, I hope you understand that my message for you, Peach Tabernacle, is that God wants to make you a vessel of honor so that your life can be memorable and it's worthy of a memorial. That you are now defining a man what the life of a true apostolic Christian should be. What a, vict a child with victory and walking with God should be. The scripture teaches us this. That the trine of our faith is more what? Precious than gold. Watch this. When gold is put into a fire, it diminishes. Because the dross is taken off and purity is revealed. But when faith is put into the fire, it multiplies. Faith never diminishes in the fire if you pass the test. It multiplies. It becomes exponential. Amen. It becomes where God takes it and takes just that mustard seed and creates a mountain. Amen. Where God takes that little bit of faith like we used to sing when I was a new convert. Faith, 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 just a little bit of faith. You don't need a whole lot. Just use what you've got. And when you pass the test, God increases and blesses and multiplies the faith. Musicians, if you'll come, I'm closing this morning. What does your trial and what does your test produce? In order to become that kind of vessel of honor, when you walk into the Smithsonian, when you go to the museums, of the world. If you go to the Bob Bullock State Museum there in Austin and you see those beautiful pieces that are on display, go with me to Paris today or New York. Go with me to the museums of the world and see the precious things that are there. What differentiates them? Well, first of all, there's some vessels that are vessels of gold and silver, and there's some that are wood and earth. The Bible says there's some vessels of honor and some of dishonor. And I've lived for God long enough. I've been in the church long enough that I've seen a whole lot of people that were vessels of honor. But I have seen a few that were vessels of dishonor. Because they fail to submit to the Master and allow Him to have His way in their life. Would you stand with me, please? Just a few months ago, a scrap metal dealer from the Midwest purchased a piece of gold that he noticed had some precious stones in it at a, at a sale. It cost him $14 thousand dollars and he was hurting so bad financially that he was taking that and buying that that piece thinking that he would sell it for scrap he was a scrap metal dealer he knew the weight of it he sensed the value of it and he said I can make brother Waddy he said I can make a quick five hundred dollar profit that'll keep me with some some fuel this week but after he bought it he noticed it had some unique things about it and he said you know I better check this out after research and you can google this just don't do it right now the prophet Google will verify that I'm preaching the truth he found out that what he had was one of eight imperial russian fabergé eggs that was missing from the czar's private resident residence in moscow russia 
in the Midwest of the United States. You want to hear the rest of the story? He sold that $14,000 egg that was going to be scrapped. But when he found out what he really had, it was an undisclosed amount. The last one that sold in private auction went for an estimated $33 million. Well, Brother Johnson, how does that apply to me? I'm so glad you asked. I'm looking at some vessels of gold and silver here today. And the enemy wants to convince you that you're a scrap pile waiting to happen. You might as well throw in the towel and quit and it's over. God's not going to come through from you. But here's the thing. I need you to understand that God's word today declares, amen, that he put something inside of you. The Bible said we have this treasure in earthen vessels. That God has put something precious inside of you and that your faith and the tried of your faith is more valuable than gold. Your testimony and your faithfulness and your walk with God are more valuable, amen, than you can imagine. And that if you will hang in here and watch God work, he's going to elevate you, amen, and he's going to put you on display and show the world his great grace in your life. Oh, thank God. How many, of you, how many of you want to join me today and say, I want to be a vessel, a man of honor. I want to be, I want to live a life that's worth remembrance and memorialize it. Amen. Would you worship God with me right now? All across this house, would you lift your hands to God? In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I've learned to trust in Jesus oh I've learned to trust in my God come on somebody oh yes through it all 